special and warm welcome to you. It's my pleasure to include, uh, introduce uh, Dr. Joseph Graves, uh, who's visiting us only for today. Uh, he is Professor and Associate Dean of Research at North Carolina A&T. Uh, who is coincidentally having their homecoming this weekend, just like us. <laughs> um, Dr. Graves received his uh, uh, BA in Biology from Oberlin College and PhD from Wayne State University. Uh, but from knowing him over the last few months, I know that he is the first African American to have a PhD in Evolutionary Biology. So he is definitely a very distinguished gentleman. And another um, Another thing that I'd like to brag on him about, that he is a fellow of AAAS. Uh, does anyone of the students here know what AAAS stands for? Can the faculty help them out? That's right. It doesn't get any better than that. So uh, we are very pleased and very, very honored to have uh, with us Dr. Graves. So as I told you, uh, from his credentials, you can gather that he is a very smart gentleman. Uh, what is not so obvious from uh, reading about him online is that he is also a very uh, nice person. He has uh, not only one uh, distinction for being a smart scientist uh, for his exceptional uh, work on evolution of aging, uh, but also he's earned distinction for being a very, very um, good mentor to aspiring uh, academics uh, such as yourself. So I hope you take the chance to listen to uh, the work that he's going to share with us and ask him questions if you have any, not just on the research, but anything that comes to your mind. So without further ado, uh, welcome and uh, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, Dr. Pai, for your invitation to be here at Spelman today. And, and I must say that I have been really impressed by all the students that I've met um, and all of the faculty that I've met. Now, I'm also going to say amongst the things that are listed there is that I'm on the executive board of a National Science Foundation Science and Technology Center called BEACON. BEACON stands for Biocomputational Evolution in Action. And it's a consortium between five universities um, led by Michigan State, but also including the University of Texas, the University of Washington, the University of Idaho, and North Carolina A&T State University, uh, my home institution. And Beacon's uh, research goal is to unify biocomputational approaches to evolution, which use things like evolutionary and genetic algorithms to solve computational and engineering problems, as well as experimental evolution to solve questions in organic evolution. Now, one of the, I think, most relevant examples of the use of organic evolution to address a problem of great significance is the issue of health disparity. Now, I'm actually one of the first people to apply evolutionary science to this issue, and hence the title of this talk, Evolutionary versus Racial Medicine, Why It Matters. Now you're also going to have to, um, oh sorry, excuse me for moving back and forth because my laptop is not seeing this. So I'm going to have to go out here and then back and forth. So that hopefully will be not too great a distraction. I can use that. Oh, thank you. So um, today's talk is going to follow a series of papers that I've written on this subject, including uh, new work on the very definition of aging itself from the point of view of Hamilton's declining forces of natural selection, which were first put forward in his epic 1966 Journal of Theoretical Biology paper, as well as my own work on the implications for evolutionary science for biomedical research. And some of the references are listed here. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? All right, um, this work will also follow two chapters in two of my books. Thank you so much for this. You should not give a Jedi a lightsaber. <laughs> you never know what could happen in here. Anyway, um, in the first book, The Emperor's New Clothes, The Emperor's New Clothes is designed to be a tour de force 
of the history of racial thinking in the Western world. Where did it come from? How was it influenced? And <coughs> then the race myth assumes that you understand the history of racial thinking in the Western world and how it then applies to ongoing social pathologies. Both of these books have chapters about the notion of racial medicine, which I'm going to talk about today. So could we have the next slide? All right, so I had a chance to talk with some very bright and engaged students at lunch, and I asked them this question. What do we mean by race? And I was not surprised when students gave some thoughtful answers, but woefully incorrect answers. Now, the reason that happens, and your students are no different from the students I've surveyed all across the United States, is because in the United States, we do not address the definition of race. We don't address it, I argue, purposely. So in the high school curriculum, conceptions of race are not addressed because one, as I've said numerous times, we still live in a racially stratified society. And our education system doesn't really want students thinking too hard about the nature of racial stratification in the United States because there's a chance they might actually do something about it. So high schools, stay away from race discussions like it's the plague. At the same time, there's a secondary reason for why high school curricula stay away from discussions of race. Because to understand the concept fully, you have to understand the difference between biological definitions of race and socially defined or socially constructed race definitions. To do that, you have to understand evolutionary science. And in the United States, in the main, high school biology curricula do not address evolution. And this, again, is not accidental. So once we address this inadequacy in high school education, then I can ask this question to a group of freshmen at a prestigious and selective university like Spelman College and get answers that make sense. But we don't do that at current. So now, let me review the biological race concept. The biological race concept has gone through several iterations in its history. It begins with examinations of morphology. In other words, what do organisms look like? And notice, I use the term organisms, not people because the biological race concept applies to a wide group, not just people. Now, it also involves the geographical location of those organisms. In the modern era, it has come to also include population concepts, particularly the frequency of genes in those populations, or alleles in those populations. So it contains all three of these elements. But the key thing is that the biological race concept is associated with concepts of speciation. In other words, it is part and parcel of the evolutionary explanation for the origin of species. And again, most students do not know, and I would argue many faculty don't know, the complete title of Charles Darwin's book, which was published in 1859. The title of that book was On the Origin of Species or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. So Darwin was talking about the process by which genetic, well, he, he would have said variants, but genetic variants in populations begin to diverge from each other such that eventually you form new species. So without understanding that process, this concept has no meaning to you. You just don't understand why it would have any relevance or significance. Now, I will contrast biological 
definitions of race with socially defined or socially constructed race. Socially constructed race arbitrarily utilizes aspects of morphology, geography, culture, language, religion, and I say etc. because you could throw in virtually any <coughs> other thing that you wished depending upon the time and place. But the key thing to understand about these socially defined conceptions of race is that they have always associated with specific social dominance hierarchies. So in other words, they don't exist in a vacuum. They're always for the purpose of reifying who should be socially advantaged, who should be socially dominant, what the rules are for the interaction between the categories which it specifies. It is never neutral. It is always part of a social agenda. Now, when you ask the average person on the street what they mean by race, and I, and I have done this, you get people going back and forth, <coughs> conflating these two conceptions as if they are the same thing, when in fact they are not. Next slide, please. So, from the point of view of biomedical research, we can start to ask a really basic question, which is, does our species have biological races? And then, how do we come to believe that we do? <coughs> so, when I show this picture to most of my students, and again, I've shown this in Arizona, I've shown it in New Jersey, I've shown it in Michigan, I've shown it in Ohio, oh my I hate to admit that, I've been to Ohio. <laughs> that was where my friend did sitting in the fourth row. But yes, I have been to that state. I tried to, to get out of there as quick as I can. But, and I've also shown it in North Carolina. And most of the students that see this picture will say, yeah, I saw him walking across campus last week. Or they might assume that he's a person of West African ancestry. But it turns out that this is a picture of a native Solomon Islander. The Solomon Islands are in the South Pacific. And in terms of genetic distance from Sub-Saharan Africans, Solomon Islanders actually are one of the groups that are farthest away from Sub-Saharan Africans. So yet this person has physical features which you might conclude means that this person is of sub-Saharan African descent. That is, in fact, not true. Next slide. Now, the reason that this can happen is because physical traits are discordant with each other. In other words, they do not correlate with each other. They mix and match depending upon a variety of environmental circumstances. And so therefore, you cannot use any physical traits to define racial groups in the human species. It simply does not work. The ones that most people assume, okay, like skin color, <coughs> hair type, skeletal features, they do not define unambiguous racial groups. The reason we think they do is because of our specific social history. They actually don't do that. So, um, the reason that this fails is because physical variation okay, results from different portions of the genome which are selected by different factors in any given environment. So, let me give some examples. Next slide. Well, let's take the one that everybody's hung up on in the United States, skin color. So in the class I spoke to today, I mentioned that skin color is coded for by about five genes out of the 125 coding genes in the human genome, which means it's absolutely insignificant as a genetic trait. However, we can see that there is variation in human skin color around the world. And not surprisingly, people in the tropics tend to have darker skin color. So there's a gradient between skin color and 
your location relative to the equator. The closer you are to the equator, the darker your skin is. For obvious reasons, there's greater solar intensity at the equator. So who can explain to me why these folks in Central America, okay, and South America, why these folks don't have dark skin? Anybody? They live in the tropics. You know, they just left the Buffalo. Now I want a student, not a professor. <laughs> Why don't those people in Central America and Northern, and I believe I have a, had a neighbor from Venezuela, and she swore to me she didn't have any African ancestry. And she is about as African as African can get. But she said, oh, we, don't have, we don't have any Africans in Venezuela. So all these records of slave ships, <laughs> and so, no, no, we don't have any Africans in Venezuela. But their average skin tone is not that of people who live in the tropics. Why not? All right, here's another way of asking the question. Where did the first anatomically modern humans evolve? Africa. Just in Africa? They, they just popped up all over Africa? Where in Africa? Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, here. Eastern Africa, the area of the Old Divide, okay? And folks began to walk around the world. They did not take airliners, did not have ocean liners. Okay, they began to walk around the world. And the last place they walked to was the Western Hemisphere. So the reason that people in Central America don't have dark skin is they haven't been living there long enough to re-evolve it. In addition, there are all sorts of cultural and technological ways that one can evolve, one can, sorry, avoid sun exposure. So people can like take siestas. So when the sun's really hot, people don't go outside. You can wear long sleeve clothing, okay? You can wear hats. And the other point that I'm gonna get to later is that the impact of having too light a skin for the solar intensity you live in isn't going to impact you until after your net future expected reproduction reaches zero. So the power of natural selection to re-evolve dark skin in the tropics is in fact quite weak. So that's why we don't see that there. Next slide. Oh, wait, wait, go, go back, go back, go back. Oh, no. <laughs> All right, what I wanted to point out also, Africa. Does everybody understand that this is a Mercator projection? Greenland really is not that big. <laughs> okay, so the sizes of the continents and the con and continents are out of proportion. So Africa is like a really huge place. If you look at the latitudes that Africa spans, so not surprisingly, there's more skin color variation on the continent of Africa than in the rest of the world combined. It's just something that I thought you all should know. So if you think that all Africans are dark skinned, that's incorrect. Next slide. All right, so now let's show you that genes for height and skin color are discordant. So this person is a Kenyan Watusi, East African, <coughs> tend to be tall and dark skinned. This person is an Eskimo or Aleut person. They tend to be short and fair-skinned. Now, we can explain their stature from some basic physiological rules. One of them is called Allen's rule. And that is organs, or not organs, but organisms from northern climates tend to have larger bodies with shorter extremities. Okay, larger body, shorter extremities. Well, those from warmer climates tend to have smaller bodies and longer extremities. This has to do with heat radiation. So those things follow the gradient of heat. But height genes are not necessarily correlated with those because these folks are Mabuti pygmies from Central Africa. This is an average height European researcher these folks have a mean height of about four and a half feet. 
They are extremely dark skinned, but they're short. So the genes that are involved in determining height, and there are many of them, and the genes that are involved in determining skin color, which there aren't that many, are not correlated with each other. Next slide. So um, I'm going to skip this discussion, but we now know that there's some really interesting stuff about short stature in pygmies that make them sort of really unique. And these are some interesting studies from Jarvis and co-workers in 2012. And you guys can look at that on your own because I have a whole lot more to talk about. So can we go to the next, next slide, please? Next one. Yeah, this is the slide I want to go to. Um, going back to um, discordance, here's an example of the allele frequencies at the vitamin D binding locus. Now, vitamin D binding locus is associated with skin color. And once again, you see from the latitudes of the tropics to the temperate zones, a clear linear decline in allele frequencies for the vitamin D binding locus. So allele one is at high frequency in the tropics. It begins to drop linearly as you move away from the tropics. Now, over here, locus 5, Q31 to 33, is associated with resistance to the parasite schistosome. And in Africa, it's mainly uh, mansoni and hematobium. So this appears where there's water. Where there's water, there's snails. Where there's snails, they're transmitting schistosomiasis. But the distribution of water in Africa <coughs> is not associated with latitude. So genetic variation on vitamin D binding locus on chromosome 12 is not going to be in any way associated with schistosome resistance on chromosome 5. So I could show you an endless set of combinations of things which are just not going to be associated with each other, meaning that the physical traits of human beings mix and match depending upon environmental circumstances. Next slide. <coughs> so, one of the things that you're going to find routinely when you look into the biomedical literature is that researchers who claim to talk about race in association with disease never give you a biological definition of race. What they assume is the socially defined racial groups are in fact biological categories. So they just take, oh, yeah, these people who we call black or whatever are a biological race. Without ever giving you a definition of what a biological race should be. So we actually do have criteria for the existence of biological race. And these have to do with two aspects of the populations. The amount of variation within versus between groups and whether we can say that these groups can be identified as unique genetic lineages. Now we've studied this in a whole variety of organisms. So I have often been misquoted by the press. LA Times once quoted me as saying, Dr. Joseph Graves said race does not exist. That's the LA Times. I never said that. I have never once said that. I don't ever say that races don't exist. What I say is that anatomically modern humans don't have races. Because how could I make the claim that anatomically modern humans don't have races unless I actually had a definition of what a race should be? So let's talk about what kinds of criteria and look at some data to show species that actually do have biological races. Next slide. So one way we can address this question is by using the F statistics that were developed by the American population geneticist Sewell Wright. Sewell Wright wanted to address how different subpopulations are from each other at various different levels. So one of the statistics that Wright introduced is called FST. And this can be generated by looking at the heterozygosity of a total population 
minus the heterozygosity of its subpopulations divided by the heterozygosity of the total population. Now here, what we mean total population and with regard to human beings is all humans worldwide. <coughs> subpopulations would be any group of humans that we wish to define as a subpopulation. So we could, for example, say Africans, Sub-Saharan Africans, Europeans, Central Asians, East Asians, Oceanians, Amer Indians, and so forth. We can come up with any set of subpopulations we wish. That's entirely arbitrary. So once we do that, we can look at multiple loci across the genome, and we can calculate the average of the expected heterozygosity in the total population versus the average of the expected heterozygosity over the subpopulations. Now Wright felt that FST, actually let me step one step backwards. FST is a statistic that's constrained to vary between one and zero. One means total population subdivision. That means you definitely have geographic races. Zero means no population subdivision. Your populations essentially have the same gene frequencies and really are not different from each other at all. So Wright gave us a sort of floor value in which we would define geographic races or subspecies, and that value was 0 0.250. At that value, Wright proposed that you have a high frequency that you would have fixation for specific genes in different subpopulations. And that's what we would expect to find if we were looking at geographic races. Now remember, for Wright, these geographic races are actually the product of isolation of gene flow on the way to becoming new species. So that's when you see geographic races form. So actually, let's look at data for humans and see whether we ever come up with these kinds of figures. Next slide. So this is for a sample of about 125 medically important genes. And these bars represent the FST values for a variety of species. I'm going to let you guess which one of those species is anatomically modern humans. Might it be this one in black <coughs> over here? Yeah. And that FST value is about 0 0.156. This is not 0 0.250. So what it says is that, yeah, there is some differentiation between human subpopulations, but not so much that we would call them geographic races. Now, interestingly enough, as a standard <coughs> of comparison, we look at other large-bodied mammals with biology similar to ours. So, for example, you wouldn't use a comparison of humans to fruit flies, because that's just unfair. That's just cheating, because fruit flies are the supreme organism of all biology. So if you look at fruit flies, you find all sorts of high FST values. They have geographic races all over the world. But in the case of <clears throat> anatomically modern humans against other large-bodied mammals, you see we are actually one of the groups that have the least amount of subdivision. Then you come over here to things like white-tailed deer, Grant's gazelle, gray wolves in North America, gray wolves in Eurasia, gray wolves all over the world. So these are populations, or species, I'm sorry, for which the distinction of geographic races makes sense. And that, again, should not be a mystery to you. Why do we have genetic variation and differentiation in gray wolves in North America? Anybody want to hazard a wild guess? Do you see gray wolves running around the streets of Atlanta? You see cats? You see dogs? You don't see gray wolves. That's because their habitats have been fractionated and isolated by human activity. When humans brought domestic animals to the Western world and created farms and cut down forests and started shooting wolves, 
they began to create isolations of wolf populations so that the gene flow between them was stopped. So what happens then is they're going to begin to accumulate different mutations and they're going to begin to diverge and they're going to begin to adapt to the conditions under which they live with no gene flow. So no surprise that these animals are going to develop geographic races. Humans, however, next slide, okay, when we look at even larger studies and more recent studies of genetic variabilities in humans, we see the same pattern. So 83,000 loci on chromosome 5, FST in the coding regions, 9, 13, 17, 21. None of these getting close to 0 0.250. Now, what about FST in the non-coding regions? Higher values. And why is that? <coughs> Anybody? Any freshman biology student who can answer that? Well, remember when we talked at lunch today about those transposable genetic elements and how if they start coding in a coding region, what happens? Is that good or bad? It's bad. Once you mess up a gene's function, then natural selection is going to begin to eliminate these deleterious mutations from the population. So there's going to be strong purifying selection in coding regions, whereas there's going to be very weak purifying selection in non-coding regions because those things, for the most part, don't make anything. So we should expect genetic variation in non-coding regions to always be bigger than what we find in coding regions. But notice, in either region, we still don't reach rice threshold of 0 0.250. Now, can you find individual loci that are greater than rice 2.50? Of course you can. One of them would be skin color loci. Okay, they're a good example of local adaptation. So if you were just using that locus alone, you can say, okay, I have FSTs greater than 0 0.250. That might mean geographic race. But unfortunately, you would be cherry picking. Because this theory has to do with the overall genetic variation across the genome, not that of individual loci. Next slide, please. Now, an even better way of visualizing this <coughs> is looking at pairwise FST calculations by geographic distance from East Africa. Since the human odyssey began there, that's the place that you want to root this analysis. So when we look at populations one against the other, we see that this is a continuous increase in FST going up again at the highest values greater but not exceeding 2.50 but the vast majority of them well below that. So what this graph is saying is rather simple. Populations that are closest to each other, each other geographically share more genes in common. The further you get away from each other the more genetic distance there is between you. Now, if there were geographic races, what do you think this pattern would look like? Because that's not evidence of geographic races at all. So what would evidence of geographic races look like? So this is what you might find. A bunch clustered here, empty. A bunch clustered here, empty. A bunch clustered here, empty. A bunch clustered there, empty, and so forth. In other words, you would see discrete blocks, not a continuous climb of SST values by population distance. We don't see that. 
Don't see that at all. Next slide. So, um, again, to make a long story short, there has been some discussion, particularly by Woodley in 2010, attempting to revise taxonomic race definitions. Now, I made short work of that paper shortly after it came out, and I'm going to just make the claim, and you can read all this stuff, that only population and lineage definitions remain relevant to discussions of race in modern biology. And we've already demonstrated that the um, population definitions simply don't work. Next slide. <clears throat> so let's try to deal with the lineage problem. Well, one way you can address that is by using an, a genetic algorithm called structure. And what structure does is it allows you, as a user, to define a number of clusters. And then you can take the genomes of individuals, and you can tell your algorithm, tell me how similar these genomes are for the number of genetic markers for which I have a sequence. Now, in this run, which was originally published in Science in 2002, in the first run, the definition is two. Now, it says that there are people who really belong mainly to this orange cluster rooted on Sub-Saharan Africa. And what you'll note is people belonging to that orange cluster include people who live in Europe, in the Middle East, in Central Asia, okay? Then you have people that are mainly in the purple cluster, rooted on the Americas in East Asia. Now, the degree to which that's a legitimate distinction is entirely arbitrary. Because this is statistically significant, it's a statistically significant run, it says you got two clusters. Now, you can also say three, in which case you get Africa, a whole bunch of people in Europe and the Middle East, and then the purple cluster reappears. Or I could say I want four. Or I could say I want five. Okay, which case? Or I could say I want six, and you see where this is going. I can continue to find clusters, and what this algorithm will do is it will tell me which group of people are more closely related to each other. And it's going to depend upon the number of clusters I ask. And since all of these are statistically significant, which one do you choose? It entirely depends upon your orientation. So here, let me give you a more recent example of the use of, of um, structure. Next slide, please. So before I do that, I'm going to let you know some of the weaknesses of this algorithm. First, Structure utilizes multi-locus genetic data to infer population structure and to assign individuals in the population. So I've really already said that. Structure produces the number of clusters that the user specifies. Or, of course, you can ask it to generate clusters based upon its algorithm. Now, its default assumptions are that all genetic markers are unlinked, which we know is not true. And linkage to equilibrium with one another within the populations, and we know that that's not true. And at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium within populations, and we know that that's not true. So all three of these assumptions of the algorithm are all false, but still people use it. It also assumes that the genetic information of individuals is derived from a single population cluster. So persons who have multiple genetic ancestries can't be run, but of course you can tell the model to deal with admixture, but you have to specify that when you run it. Next slide. So, now, structure places heavy emphasis on the idea that the world once harbored distinct and independently evolved populations. So this is this question of unique genetic lineage. So it's a sort of assuming that that's true. Um, these populations have now undergone a sort of admixture of an unstated type. Yet we know that this model of human evolution is incorrect. For example, the loss in Hanley data that I showed in the last slide. Structure also requires the existence of large amounts of loci in which there are private alleles in the populations in question, that is, have a high delta value between populations, and that's not always true. 
Um, we know that these loci are rare. And challenging any of these misconceptions, as Weiss and Long did in their analysis of structure in 2009, leads you to get non-structured structures in which people who are all, all sub-Saharan Africans end up in different clusters. People who are European end up in different clusters. People who are East Asian end up in different clusters simply by changing those assumptions in the basic model. So while structure is widely used, there are also issues with the <coughs> assumptions of the algorithm to begin with. Next slide. So um, here's a somewhat very famous study that appeared by Sarah Tishkoff from Sarah Tishkoff and her co-workers in Science in 2009. Next slide. And this is what I want to show you. This is, again, a structure analysis of the world. Um, and this is hard for you to see. But in this analysis, she ends up with 14 clusters, again, rooted on Sub-Saharan Africa, Western Africa, Central Africa, Eastern Africa. And notice, most of the clusters are where? In Africa, and why is Southern Africa? Okay, why is that true? Anybody? We talked about it at lunch today, why is that true? Where's most of the genetic variation in the world? Sub-Saharan Africa. Sub Africa. So why are most of the clusters in Africa? Because most of the genetic variation in the world is in Sub-Saharan Africa. So then you get these other folks, whoever they are. Next slide. So point that I'm trying to make here is Tishkoff then went on to examine various ethno-linguistic groups in Africa and how they fared in the cluster analysis. And what you find, contrary to the popular European and European-American notion of Africa, is that that's that place where those black people live is that there's, in fact, a tremendous amount of genetic variation between ethno-linguistic groups across the African continent. So there isn't just one kind of African. It's just not true. Africa is a very large continent with a great deal of genetic variability, and populations differ from each other in their genetic composition. Next slide. <coughs> so. What does human genetic variation tell us? Well, anatomically modern humans are a young species. And in fact, we have very little genetic variation. And here's my favorite anecdote for how little genetic variation we have. One tribe of West African chimpanzees has more genetic variation than the entire human species. We're a young species, very little variation. All persons alive today are descended from persons who lived in Africa between 150,000 to 70,000 years ago. Now, you do carry amongst you, by the way, the genetic material of <coughs> archaic humans. So persons of sub-Saharan African descent carry about 3% of their genome from archaic humans who lived in sub-Saharan Africa. <coughs> Europeans carry about 3% of their genome that came from Homo neanderthalensis. Neanderthals are not modern humans. And other archaic humans around the world. Now, some people are descended from persons who left Africa and adapted to the local conditions. None of these genetic adaptations justify biologically classified human races. So yeah, we have genetically based, or sorry, backwards. We have geographically based genetic variation. That does not mean that we have biological races. Okay, those are two separate things. Next slide. So now, what about socially defined race? The key thing here to understand is that socially defined races do not match biological variations. They are arbitrary and are the product of social antagonisms. People should not believe that innate or genetically determined racial differences are responsible for the position of individuals within society. 
Scientifically, there's absolutely no reason to believe that. Yet, it is advanced in whole avenues of biomedical research as if that's an unalterable, unquestioned fact. When, in fact, there's no scientific, intellectual reason to believe it. None. Finally, if genes can't explain why groups are subordinated, well, then it follows that we must look to our social practices. I.e., how does institutionalized racism, for example, explain patterns of inequality? Because genetic variation doesn't do it. Now I'm going to give specific examples of that. Next slide. So, um, to resuscitate evolutionary reasoning, okay, because there have been issues with it. Um, early attempts attempting to utilize evolutionary principles towards social science were deeply flawed. And I write about them in detail in The Emperor's New Clothes. People made all sorts of silly assumptions about genes and evolution and society, okay, including big name evolutionary biologists. However, okay, and I just talked about eugenics, da da da. So, uh, now, now, I don't even know why I, I put this slide in here, but let, let me try to go back. <laughs> So here's an example. Eugenics was championed by both right and left wing ideologues. So it wasn't just right wing people saying that eugenics um, is valuable for society. Left wing ideologues were saying it too. You had to evolve a new kind of human for the socialist revolution. They literally they said that. So um, while the eugenics movement caused tremendous suffering and failed at its mission, we actually still carry out some eugenic practices, such as genetic counseling. Genetic counseling informs parents who are at risk of producing a child with serious disease of their risks and options. Now, this is different from the government saying to you, you can't reproduce because you have such a situation. It's a genetic counselor saying to a couple, this could potentially happen, so you need to decide whether you want to reproduce or not. But yet, that is essentially a eugenic practice. Now, because of this, genetic counseling in the American Jewish community has reduced the frequency of take sax allele so that it is less than that of the general population. So you used to think of take sax as being a Jewish disease. Not in America, not anymore. Because of careful genetic counseling and families deciding not to marry their children when they have a risk of producing a take sax child, the frequency of this disease in this community is now less than that of the background mutation rate. Next slide. So, which brings me to my favorite saying. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. This was authored by Dadodius Dobzhansky, who, by the way, is one of my intellectual grandfathers. Uh, and therefore, by extension, nothing in human biology makes sense. By extension, nothing in human social behavior makes sense. Hence, social dominance, age, gender, and other factors, in fact, is something that's in the evolution of a variety of species, including ours. Why then is social science operated in the dark, literally, no pun intended, for so long? Next slide. Well, one of the things that we can understand is the magnitude of social dominance in human societies has changed. So, um, anatomically modern humans, we say, again, about 200,000 years old. It makes sense to imagine that the age hierarchies are relatively old. Parents over offspring, elders over young adults, elder over most aged. So this is something that's a general feature of most societies. However, there is some evidence that gender hierarchy is associated with the domestication of animals in agriculture. That this is, in fact, new. So this is something that's only been happening for the last 10% of our existence as a species. Uh, this arbitrary set is even younger. So that it's highly unlikely that our brains have evolved mechanisms that deal 
with the stress caused by subordination well. There isn't much evidence, or sorry, there isn't much evidence that other species of primates do well under socially induced stress either. So we know that organisms that are social don't like to be subordinated by other organisms. And this leads to a cascade of hormonal and behavioral issues which in turn can influence the health of that organism. And this has been well demonstrated in Sapolsky's review of social dominance in other primates. Next slide. So let me give you a timeline then of some things of real interest to understanding health. So, you know, here we are, hominid ancestors about two million years ago, homo sapiens, about 200,000 years ago, and I argue that age and gender probably start around this time. Some leave Africa, New Guinea, Europe, Western Hemisphere. Now, agricultural centers begin to get established around 23,000 to 10,000 years ago, and this is where we start seeing certainly age, gender, and arbitrary set hierarchies. Okay, Mesopotamia, slave society, feudalism in Europe, bubonic plague in Europe, Columbus in the New World. You notice I put racism as one of the most recent, recently derived of the social dominance hierarchy traits. And that's because I'm not saying that racism didn't exist prior to this time. I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is that it is certainly codified with the European voyages of discovery and the age of colonialism. So by now you actually start getting people writing okay, about race and racial hierarchy in ways that they didn't in previous societies. So now, transatlantic slave trade, raw sugar, capitalism well established in Europe, industrial revolution, you know, long ago we were around Okay. Cardiovascular disease is extremely new as a major source of death in our societies. High fructose corn syrup, notice how close these two come together. Food dyes, artificial sweeteners, and we really have no way of knowing what the impact of these things are because they've been around for such a short period of time. Next slide. So, um, how much time do I have? I'm not sure I'm not very good watching it. It's about eight minutes. I got eight minutes. Yeah. I, I probably should have dropped a few slides. <laughs> but let's uh, do something real quick. Um, evolutionary explanations of disease. All individuals within a species are attempting to increase their survival and reproduction. All do so at the expense of other individuals, both within and between species. So this may bring to mind the nature, red and tooth and claw <coughs> analogy of 19th century poetry, but it is sort of correct. So um, in terms of how disease can happen, the ones that we're quite familiar with are infection. Both acute and chronic and stealth infections cause a great deal of the burden of disease. And the question is, then is how do we develop resistance to such diseases? or not. Can anybody tell me what this is a picture of? This is a really good example of evolution at work. This is a female Schistosoma mansoni worm in the capillaries of an infected patient. You see what this little thing is? Anybody want to guess what that is? That's a male Schistosoma mansoni worm. He lives in the gynophoric groove of the female. Okay, so when the male egg hatches, it swims and finds the female and fits into the gynophoric groove. And all this male does his entire life is produce sperm. Doesn't feed itself, can't do anything. It's a complete and total parasite in every sense of the word. Whereas the female does all the feeding which she does through her integument or skin, no digestive tract, okay, and produces thousands and thousands of eggs per day. 
So the disease does not really develop from the amount of nutrients that the parasites suck out of the host. In fact, the disease develops from the host's immune system going into hyperactivity because of all of the eggs that the female produces in the infected individual. Now, the vast majority of animal species are parasites. Okay? And that's just animals. You also throw in fungi, bacteria, and viruses. You can see that there are many ways for large-bodied organisms to become infected. Now, next source of disease is inborn errors of metabolism. These are generally rare. These are caused by defective genes, for which we have talked about earlier in this discussion. Next slide. Okay. Now, this one is actually the one that's probably most important in terms of understanding complex disease in Western societies. That is, contingencies of our evolutionary development. These are age-related pathologies resulting from the inability of natural selection to eliminate alleles that have deleterious impacts at late age. So virtually every one of the complex diseases that are highest on the list of human mortality in Western societies, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, stroke, all of these things are age-related genes, are age-related resulting from genes that have not been eliminated by natural selection because natural selection is simply not concerned with what they do at later age. Now, another example of a contingency of our evolutionary development, infant mortality is related to the contradiction between human intelligence manifested in large head size and pelvic girdle size related to our ability to walk, run upright. And these are true of all people. So in and of themselves, these kinds of things can't be the source of health disparities. Something else has to interact with them for such things to be responsible for health disparities. Uh, another example of this is the evolutionary mismatch hypothesis. Here, humans evolved in environments, physical and social, that are very different from our current environments. And so hence, we don't have adaptations that allow us to be able to handle these new environments, like the one that I just mentioned. The human brain reacts very poorly to the perception of unjust treatment. This then leads to a cascade of complex diseases, and of course some of us suffer more than others because some of us are placed in positions of more subordination than others. Next slide. All right, so here are some real examples of novel environments leading diseases to diseases of stress and inequality. So, consider how maternal weight influences the blood pressure profile of their children. Okay? Maternal energy stores and diet composition during pregnancy program influence adolescent blood pressure. Or the role of exposure to endocrine disruptors on the fertility of offspring. Or the role of chronic stress on low birth weight. Next. Okay. Now, exposure to novel toxins that weren't around. This is for America, and this is just for the state of New Jersey, but you will find similar data in every state of the union. So if we look at releases of toxic chemicals by race, the ratio is 1.43 for ethnic minorities compared to ethnic majorities in this country. Cancer risk from hazardous air pollutants, 1.50. Facilities emitting, emitting criteria air pollutants, 3.68. Superfund sites per square mile, 3.04. Now notice that other variables such as income, home ownership, which is related to income, are also disparate for individuals in this society. Next. So this is black, white, age-specific mortality rates for 100,000 from the years 1963, 1980, and 1996. So this is, you know, to the end of the 20th century. And this is the equality line. This is the age category here. And what you see for these data is that 
African Americans have higher age-specific mortality across the 20th century until you get to the oldest ages where that disappears. But now, why is this so interesting? If I told you that there were differences in the teen years, most of you would say, okay, yeah, I know about that. But look at what happens at age 45, okay, age 35. Look at how high the, dis dis the disparities are. Now, why are those ages so important? <laughs> For our community, why is the age like 40, 45 years old so important? What do you do when you're that age? Work. Not just work, but you've reached probably the prime of your earning potential. That's when you're either, you know, if you're going to be something in whatever you do, you're making the most money at these ages, but you can't make that money if you're dead. So you don't leave that wealth to your children. Okay, and in many cases, folks don't have insurance, and so this helps to perpetuate the cycle of poverty. Next slide. So, again, this is more of these ratios, which most of you are familiar with. Okay, heart disease, knee, malignant neoplasm, cerebrovascular, pulmonary, etc. Next slide. And again, Okay, of course, this is one of my favorites, homicide and legal intervention. Okay. Next. All right, so, and I'm just going to end on, on two slides because I know we're over time. So, you know, do these data follow from a simple genetic hypothesis? No. And I'll tell you why. The argument is made even more absurd by recent genome-wide studies that show the Europeans actually have a greater load of deleterious mutations than Africans do. So if all these diseases that I showed you, the biological origin, which are higher in persons of African-American social identity in the United States, were the basis of genetics, or were resulting from genetics, you would find, or you should find, in a genome-wide study of such people they should have more deleterious genetic mutations. But in fact, it's the other way around. Europeans have more deleterious genetic mutations than Africans. So therefore, the real question is, if more European alleles are deleterious, why do European Americans have lower mortality and morbidity rates than African Americans? It should be the other way around by a simple genetic hypothesis. Okay. Other examples. How about hypertension? Right? Hypertension is supposed to be an African-American disease. So I actually surveyed the literature on hypertension a few years back. And I looked at the genetic variants that were classified as protective genetic variants and the ones that were classified as risk-causing genetic variants. And I looked at the frequency of these alleles in African-Americans and European-Americans. And in 27 out of 33 such genetic systems, African Americans had a higher percentage of the protective alleles than of the risk alleles. And again, if hypertension differentials were simply genetic, it should be the other way around. African Americans should have more of the risk alleles, but it's the other way around. African Americans have more of the protective alleles. So you can't explain that on the basis of a simple genetic hypothesis. Next slide. Okay. Um, since you guys know about malaria, this is such an overdone thing, can you go a few more slides and I'm going to end on this last slide. Okay, keep going. Keep going. All right, uh, keep going. This is the one I want to show. Most of the disease alleles that are used in the classic treatments of disease differentials are simple genetics with high penetrance. So an example is sickle cell anemia. Generally, if you have the sickle cell anemia allele and you're homozygous for it, you develop the disease. Okay, so it's real simple genetics. If you have it, you got it. Now, it turns out that most of the diseases that are of interest to um, health disparity issues, such as heart disease, stroke, diabetes, don't follow simple Mendelian patterns. 
They're in fact driven by complex genetics, or what we would call quantitative genetics. So to understand the genetic contribution to complex disease, we have to utilize this equation here, <coughs> where we're looking at the variance in the phenotype. And there's a variance, does everybody know what statistical variance is? It's a, something we can calculate from distributions. So how many people have this disease on average versus the variation? So we can calculate that and we can then break down the contributions to the variance in that complex trait as being due to genetics, environment, gene by environment interaction, plus twice the covariance of gene by environment plus variance due to error. When you look in the biomedical literature, they tend to present the equation with two terms, genes and environment. They leave out this, this, and this. Now, of course, their assumption is they're such good researchers, they don't make mistakes. So, you know, I might agree when you're measuring body weight, probably didn't make a mistake. When you're measuring height, you probably didn't make a mistake. However, when you're measuring a phenotype like uh, major depressive disease, that could easily be a mistake. So for some of these complex diseases, error terms can be quite significant, particularly if there's a bias in the way you create the error. <coughs> now, um, one more slide, and I'll tell you why this one is such a pernicious problem. Okay, keep going. Keep going. This is it. Okay. This is a covariance table that is often not investigated when we deal with this term. Here's genotype A. Let's say the genotype A is found predominantly in the benign environment. You're going to say genotype A doesn't get heart disease. And that's because genotype A, gene A, is such a good gene. That's why you don't get heart disease. Now, look at gene B. Gene B is differentially found in the toxic environment. And the researchers will conclude, gene B is a bad gene. So in my paper on evolutionary versus racial medicine, I have a section called the genetically sick African American. Because you know we have like every bad gene for every disease. It's amazing how many bad genes we have. And, you know, I would argue the reason that our genes are so bad is because, it's not because the genes are bad, it's because we inhabit toxic environments. Whereas others inhabit benign environments. So you can't apportion the genetic cause in that equation unless you account for this covariance, which most of these people do not do. They associate a gene with a phenotype, and they assume that the cause of the phenotype is a gene. Not the fact that the gene might be associated with a group of people who are under better conditions than other folks who have a different gene. And if you change the environment altogether, you could flip-flop. Gene B could actually become the good one, and gene A could become the bad one. Yes? These genotypes are alleles of the same trait? Yeah, so for example, Let's say we have two alleles dealing with heart disease, or two genotypes dealing with heart disease. They say, oh, this one's good, that one's bad. It's not good because it's good, it simply happens to be amongst people who live in an environment that's benign. Could the emergence of genotype B in the toxic environment be protected as well? Um, you mean, could, could this, in, in the case, could this in fact be a result of selection for dealing with this toxic environment? It could in theory, but most of the time what you're simply doing is you're looking at genetically, ba I mean, geographically based genetic variation that actually has nothing to do with the phenotype in and of itself, except that one group of people happen to be in, in a toxic environment and therefore they have all sorts of problems, whereas the other group is in a good environment and don't have those problems. All right, so with that, I'm going to end because I, I know I went shamelessly over time. <laughs>
and, and I could continue to talk, but I know you guys have places to go and things to do, so I'm going to stop here. So thank you for your attention. Dr. Graves, I, I know several of you may have plans for today. Uh, it's an exciting evening for our campus, so please feel free to leave. Those of you who wish to continue the discussion or ask questions of Dr. Graves, please feel free to stay back. We do have a few moments uh, before. Uh, yes. sure. Sure, that's fine. That's fine. So those of you who are interested in questions, 